Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. Okay, we're going to kick off our playthrough of Aftermath, a game from Jerry Hawthorne. And uh, two disclaimers. Number one, there will be spoilers. I'm not going to keep anything hidden. So if you're adverse to spoilers at all, uh, probably don't watch this Let's Play series. Maybe skip ahead in a, however long it takes me to get to my final thoughts and review. Two, do not use this uh, series as a how to play series. That is not my forte. There will be mistakes made. And um, yeah, so never use my videos as how to play. Anyways, we are going to read some of the initial uh, narrative because I do think that the writing in this game is pretty dang good and it deserves to, uh, to be uh, it, it deserves to be experienced and since this is such a thematic game and we are dealing with a you know this is a a youtube channel that focuses first and foremost on art and theme in these kinds of games it is important to experience so this is the second part of the day of great calamity Messiah closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. He tries to blank his mind, but, the senses, but his sensitive mouse ears pick up all the noises of the colony. The squeaks of playful young furs, distant hammering, and the hum of countless conversations all prevent him from calming his nerves. Easy there, says Grumple, as she lays a guinea pig paw on his shoulder. No need to be nervous. This is the easy part. Easy for you to say, he replies. Everybody trusts you already. Hey, I'm new to this too, she reminds him. You think people look at my bulk and think I should be out in the field? I've got something to prove too, but there's no need to fret about the departure. Like I said, this is the easy part. Mosiah shakes his hand and Mosiah shakes his head and the two of them walk to the gates to meet up with the others. Ringer and Whisper. Okay, so we're not playing with uh, Ringer and Whisper right now. We're playing with Mosiah and Grumple. But uh, this game, kind of like Mice and Mystics, always assumes that like all the characters are kind of in a group. But then we're focusing on the ones that are actually in play. Uh, Ringer and Whisper are ready there are already there waiting for them. Ringer practically bounces with excitement and Whisper frowns as she does her best to pretend she can't see him. We're finally doing it, the hamster calls out. It's the big day. Yes, it is, agrees Patch. And turning, Mazion and his friends see the colony leaders, Patch and Tidbit, arriving with the providers. Even Ringer falls silent. The providers are living legends, seasoned warriors, skilled crafts critters and expert scouts these grizzled professionals are responsible for protecting the colony as well as foraging in the wilds for food water and other supplies so it sounds like our characters are kind of like budding uh budding providers you know maybe at the end of our campaign they will become the the uh the next generation of providers ready to get to it asks Cookie, giving a wink to the nervous trainees. Yes, squeals Ringer. The rest of you are silent, but try to look confident. After several weeks of intense training, you are indeed ready to go out on your first mission. Becoming providers will allow the colony to expand and store more food, but it's dangerous work. The world beyond the safety of the colony is filled with countless perils. The predators that once cowered from the humans now roam with impunity, and many critters desperate for resources have become territorial and aggressive. You know, with all this mention of the word critter, I'm really surprised that I had not heard the term critter crawl before. Uh, there's no way that that term wasn't used before I, before I used it, but um, I'm surprised I don't see it more, more often. Now, you leave at once. Uh, let's see. Uh, the predators that once cowered from the humans now roam with impunity, and many critters, desperate for resources, have become territorial and aggressive. Providers are considered heroes for a reason, and everyone has the scars to prove it. You leave at once, traveling toward the fabled dungeon of Injo. That's E N J O. Injo. You are mostly silent as a multitude of thoughts fire rapidly through your minds. The providers give little reassurance, assurances here and there, but point out items of interest on the walk. But the providers have their own mission this day, and halfway to Enjo, you part ways. Trust yourself. 
says Tuft before leaving, and trust each other. And remember, if you gotta turn tail and retreat, then by all means do so. Collect the Raid on Enjo mission card. This will be your main mission for this game session. So this is the first main mission. This is the Raid on Enjo. We'll read that in a second. Uh, let's see, players, uh, choose a player to be the bookkeeper. Give that player the campaign dashboard. Okay, so this is how we're gonna keep track of our campaign and our settlement. The first thing we do is we're gonna place our um, clue dial on zero and our time dial on zero. All right, and then we're gonna place our food and morale and scrap dials to five. So there's five scrap, five morale, and five food that we have stored up right now. And our population is only at eight. So that's the starting condition of our settlement. Move the party location marker to an adjacent location on the map. So we start at Abigail Lane here. Um, I actually laminated my travel map because it's a little thin. And I knew this was something that when we played with the group, you would kind of pass around. And I know it would bother me if it didn't <laughs> if it didn't lay flat on the table so i laminated mine just to give it a little bit more strength and this is our party token so we're at abigail lane here move the party location marker to an adjacent location on the travel map we suggest traveling to e street which is just adjacent so on this travel map you can travel orthogonally to adjacent areas and that's how you're going to be um, experiencing different parts of the adventure book so we could move down to Parkway or we could move over to East Street, uh, east or south. But we need to make it to Enjo and we need to try to make it in the time limit allotted so we know nothing bad happens while we're out. Once you have traveled to an adjacent location on the travel map, go to the page number listed on that location. All right, so let's take a look real quick at our, um, at our mission card here. So patch puts a paw on Messiah's shoulder and says, I can't believe my son is old enough to raid Enjo. So Patch, one of the elders, one of the providers, is Messiah's father. Um, he shakes his head in disbelief. Listen, you be careful out there. Be alert and don't get cocky. Your mom is going to be worried sick, even with Grumple along for protection. I'll be fine, groans Messiah. You will be, agrees Patch, as long as you trust each other and work together. So our mission goal is we need to find a way into the dungeon of Enjo. Get out with a big, with a bag of onion snoodles. Um, I have a feeling onion snoodles are like Funyuns there. Uh, somebody at Plat Hat is a fan of Funyuns. I had Funyuns for the first time in many years, a few months ago, and they were not nearly as good as I remember them being. Um, and it tells us that our mission objective is at space C1 on the map, which I've already shown you, and we have uh, five time to get there. And once again, we don't lose the game or the campaign or anything if we go over that amount of time. Just certain bad things can happen to us, uh, to our settlement. Um, if we successfully complete this mission, we will read 98.1, and if we have a failure, we will read 98.2. So that is our main mission. We need to keep that in mind. So I think what we're gonna do is we are just going to take the advice of the uh, adventure book and we are going to move over to E Street. And so we turn to page five. Okay, so here we go. Here's our map set up. I know it is a little difficult to see the icons, but I will try to point them out as we play. Okay, so at the start, if this is your first time on this page during this campaign, read the following. Okay, the first thing we do is we advance the time by one. So we're at one right now. And then, ah, snarls Grumple in irritation as Messiah's cloak tickles her nose. Let's see if I can get a little closer in on there. Now, do you see anything yet? The young mouse stands on Grumple's burly shoulders, peeking through a knot hole in the wooden fence. Mazaya scans the quiet street on the other side, taking in the hulking forms of decaying cars and patches of tall grass that grow from cracks in the ruined pavement. It isn't much cover from birds, 
but all the use but but and all but useless if you run into a cat. It'll be a lot of running for cover, but the coast is clear, Mazias says as he drops slightly from Grumple's shoulders. About time, grouses Ringer. Shh hisses Whisper with a glare. Ringer just winks and smiles crookedly, jiggling hamster cheeks full of nibbles. You push aside the loose fence board and push into the tall grass on the other side. You are going to risk the city street and and your turn and your tums turn sour as adrenaline floods your little bodies. All right, so setup. We're gonna place all of our characters on the start space, and that is this space here. So again, we have uh, Messiah there, and we have Grumple. So they're gonna go there. I'm trying to move this down so we can keep that on camera a little bit. All right. Um, place clue tokens in the indicated spaces. So we do have to place some clue tokens. Now the way the clue tokens work is clue tokens come in three different difficulties ranging from two, three, and four. And you always start off populating the board with the twos first. And then as you play through your adventure, you go up. So it kind of shows how like at the beginning there's more resources out there and your scavenging is a little easier. But then as you adventure on, scavenging gets a little harder, but the rewards become a little greater. So we place one of these after mixing them up into each spot with a clue space, with a clue icon. So that's gonna be those. We have one there. Okay, so these are super important to get because these will add resources to our colony. Food, scrap, uh, I think some batteries, all that kind of stuff. Um, right now, the situation is safe until we have an encounter drawn. And then encounter, draw an encounter card. All right, so we have our encounter deck here. I'm gonna give that a shuffle. And let's see what our first encounter is. Okay, Gecko Warband. Actually, whoops, you know what? This actually was not supposed to be in there yet. I believe, uh, was it? I forgot. I don't think that was supposed to be in there, but I'm just going to double check my, uh, um, no, we're good. We're good. That one was. The cards that you add will have a little symbol like that down at the bottom. And I had played through a couple, um, a couple practice scenarios and I remember adding one card, but I did take it out. For some reason, I thought that this was the card we added, but it's not. Okay. Uh, situation becomes hostile. Okay. Uh, the scaled ones respect nature, Patch had told you, but they are haughty and hard to read. Set up. Encounter a, a number of random scaled ones equal to the number of characters. When we defeat this, we will gain two scrap items as loot. So the way we generate an encounter is we're going to grab the, um, the enemy deck here, the normal enemies. And we are looking for scaled ones. Now this is one of the parts where I think it's a little ambiguous in the rule book because uh, I could see, now I wanna take a, an aside here real quick. I'm gonna be a little nitpicky with the rules and, um, and the way they're explained only because I think it's important to bring attention to this kind of thing. Aftermath, and I think a lot of Jerry Hawthorne's games are, I, can, I would consider them gateway dungeon crawls, okay? These are games that I could easily imagine and know for a fact that represent uh, kind of like the first steps a lot of people take, especially uh, families and younger game players and people who aren't like into like the super dark or gritty nature of a lot of dungeon crawls. These are like the first kinds of games like this that they play. And so with that, I think it's super important for a rule book for these kinds of games to be even overly detailed in how to do certain things. And so I could easily see people getting a little confused on, okay, select uh, scaled ones. And then looking through the monster deck, 
and not seeing anything with a big name up here called scaled ones. Okay, so scaled ones is actually the type. And so you're gonna look at this smaller uh, type here and you're gonna find um, something here that says scaled ones. And then of course, you will get to the gecko leader as a scaled one. So he's a scaled one. The gecko hunter is a scaled one another gecko hunter, and another gecko hunter. So we have four scaled ones. So I know some of you may think that I'm being a little nitpicky with some of the um, some of the rules descriptions and how they're laid out, but I, um, I just wanna point out some of the things that I think could be done better and for people who maybe this is like one of their first times i know for for us you know dungeon crawl veterans maybe it's not so much a problem but for some it might be anyway so we're gonna shuffle up our scaled ones and we're gonna draw two at random and then we place those over here on the threat track and this is where we keep our our enemies and we're gonna place the gecko leader Okay, so um, he, if he have a, uh, we'll discuss how he attacks later, but he has a one health, he has a defense of seven, which is what we have to hit to defeat him for one health. And if the situation was safe, we could try to converse with him to convince him to join our, um, our settlement. So we're gonna place him in slot one, and then we're gonna place one of the gecko hunters, get one, six, and seven on slot two. And then we're gonna grab our minis. So we have our, um, let's see, the leader has a circle base. And the hunter that we're gonna use has a square base. So we have our, our enemy minis here. And those get placed onto the enemy entrance space, which is also our exit space. All right. So that was our encounter. And remember, if we defeat all of those geckos, we will get two scraps for loot. Uh, rule reminder, the colony always needs resources to survive. To gather a resource, move your character onto a space with a resource token. That's one of these little clue tokens. And then you're gonna do an instinct skill test. That's the light bulb. Now this is one area where I, re where I really think the rule book falls down. Nowhere is there a box, a, a sidebar, or anything that shows the different stat icons associated with what they are called or what they might be useful for. So like on the back of the book, we have this rules reference. It doesn't list, it doesn't have a box showing what any of the icons mean. And there's a couple parts in this book where, for instance, here, the first time you come across the the icons on your campaign dashboard in the rule book, it doesn't list what those mean. Or when you come across these icons here on that are gonna be on the map, it just shows the icon without giving you a detailed like description of what it actually is. You kind of have to look over here on this map page and then match up numbers to figure it out. But here it would be, so like, it's kind of like when, um, you know, when you have an abbreviation, the first time you show the word, you show the whole word, and then in parentheses you put, this is gonna be abbreviated like this, right? Well here, so it would be really helpful if like you said, um, whenever a game effects instructs clock plus X, if it said like, you know, time dial or scrap dial or something like that, or up here, same thing. But with the icons for the attributes, you actually have to look at the action card setup and then here it tells you that agility strength resistance and instinct it tells you the color but again it doesn't show you the icon so then you have to kind of look up here and figure out um, if the what the icon is but what if you're colorblind red and green you know um, so icons are you know there are pictorial abbreviations so I really thought that this game could use a sidebar or a card a single card that shows you every icon what it's actually called within the terms of the game and what it is used for 
But anyway, so we are going to be, uh, I hope you guys don't mind me doing these kind of like let's play slash reviews. I find it more helpful to do a review while I'm playing the game because as things come up, it's just easier to tackle at that moment. But anyway, we will have to do a test to find these clues. Okay, so we are all done with setup. And now we're going to go to our player turns. And we're going to start with Messiah as the first player. And we're going to kind of keep the board by him and then we'll move the board down as it's uh, somebody else's turn. So the first thing you do on your turn is you're going to draw up to five of these action cards to keep into your hand. So one, two, three, four, five. And let's take a look at what we got. All right, not bad. A lot of low number cards, but no black cards, no bad cards. Um, again, these, this is for resistance. This is for instinct. This is for strength melee, and this is for agility and ranged attacks. These white cards, they can be used as a wild for anything. And these are the cards that can be used to trigger your special powers. So, we have a couple things on the board here. We have our um, our white lines separate the spaces we can move in between. These green lines, so there'll be green and blue and red lines. These represent um, spaces that are hard to move across, or lines that are hard to move across. And you have to match um, a movement card with that color. Uh, there is a little bit of ambiguity about this, I think, because to move, you play a card and then you can move that many number of spaces. However, it takes three points of movement to move across a colored line unless all of your, the movement cards you play match that color. Well, what if I only play one movement card? Then I could easily, I have one point of green movement, so I can easily move across that green line, but then I can, can, t I can take another movement action separate from that movement action to keep moving because it says that all of the cards played have to match that color in order to move over for one point of movement but one is all so a little little ambiguity there but anyway that's not what we're going to do we we are going to have Messiah move over here and grab this uh, search token there so what I'm going to do is I am going to play um, one point of movement using a red card. Now if I wanted to move more on this single movement turn, I could add more cards that either match the color or the number. But I don't need to do that. I'm just going to move one. And now I'm in a space with this token here. So now I can try to uh, an instinct check. And what I do is, let's see here, I want to just double check here, uh, scavenge. Resolve an instinct skill test to gain the prize of the token. So this is not a, there are two different kinds of skill tests. There are normal and opposed. Normal, you just roll the white die and add that to your total. On an opposed, you roll both dice and you add the black one to the opponent, to the opposed total. So I'm gonna to try to search this, and this has a two on it, so I need to get at least a two. I'm going to play, you have to initiate that with a um, matching yellow card. So we have our yellow one, and then I'm going to go ahead and say that I'm gonna add another one to that so I can match that. So that's two now. So now I roll that, and oh, I got a minus one. So I do not pass that check. So this card ha or this die has everything from zero. It's minus one, minus two, plus two, and plus threes, minus one, plus ones. Kind of a fudge die. So those cards are discarded. Um, let's see here. Well, I could try this again with my white card, which I think I will. So that is a wild two, and I'm gonna use that. So let's roll this again. And there's a plus three. So now I'm at five total. I successfully scavenged this and let's see what we find. We find two food. Excellent. So we're gonna raise our dial to two. So we have seven food now. And I have one card left. It's a resistance card for defense. I'm gonna keep that. And now it is going to be Grumple's turn. 
So we're going to discard everything here. So Grumple's going to draw a hand of five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this is good. So we have, so we got to draw, then we check for Calamity. We didn't draw a Calamity card, but we did draw a Threat card. And what we do is we take our Threat card and we add it to the Threat track. And if there is an enemy space, enemy card in there, we add it under. And that is actually going to dictate what the enemy does when it is the enemy's turn. So when the enemy's turn, here, he has a one there, he's gonna use his twin knives. If he had a three, he would use his boomerang. And then at any time, the threat, the number of threat cards is equal to or greater than the number of enemy cards, the enemies get a turn. But we only have one threat card there. And we have a number of these, so let's see here. Um, we really, what we would need to do is we need to get to this exit space because we need to cross the street. And so while leaving this exit space, move your party to an adjacent space on the travel map. So that's all we're really trying to do at this particular point in the scenario is get across the street so we can get closer to the dungeon of Injo. So let's see, what is Grumple going to do? I think Grumple is going to spend um i'm gonna spend one point of movement there to move him here and then i'm going to go ahead and use this green card to move him there and i'm going to save these for defense and putting him in a better situation to hopefully scavenge those okay so that was both of our characters turns um, the last thing you do on a turn is you check for threat to see if you have an enemy turn, but we do not because we only have one threat card. And so we are back to the top of a round. So we're going to pass the dashboard down and now it is going to be Grumple's turn first. Now Grumple has a hand of two. At this point I could discard those to draw five, but I'm going to keep those and draw three more. Now let's see what I get here. Ooh, okay, so now we're gonna add this to the um, next spot on our threat. So now we are gonna have an enemy turn when we check for threat. So that, you do have to think a little bit now because the enemies are going to attack on their turn and you kind of need to keep certain cards to uh, for defense. Um, let's see here, I have a, Three. That three is not really going to help Grumple out at all, but these three could be used for defense. So I think we're just going to. I think we're going to pass. I think Grumple is just going to stay where he is here. And then let's see, we placed our threat. We're not going to take any actions. Now we check for threat. It is a hostile situation. We do have two enemies with threat cards on them. So we are going to have an enemy turn. So we go in order. So the leader is a one. So what's he gonna do? He's going to use his twin knives. So he's gonna move up to three, does no range, and he's gonna have an attack value of five. And after taking a turn with this gecko, take one additional turn with it using the same threat card. So he's gonna like go in and use his daggers twice basically, ouch. So let's see, so he's going to move and he can move into this space. Enemies are not hindered by any terrain except for uh, double white lines, nobody can move across. So he's gonna move into here and he's actually going to be attacking Grumble. And remember, he's gonna do this twice. So that means Grumble's gonna get attacked twice. So Grumble has a plus one to any defense check. And now this first attack, what is it gonna do? It's gonna do five, I have to beat a five. So what I think I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna try to defend against this attack using everything I have, because if I split it up, I may end up taking both. So we're gonna spend all three cards. I'm gonna initiate a defense with a defense card, a blue. Then I can add any cards that match the color or the number. 
So right now I have a one, two, three. I have four defense. Ooh, but I need to beat a five. Man, I may not be able to do this at all. Um, well, that's the best I can do. So we're gonna have to see if I can get lucky here. I'm gonna roll these. No, did not get lucky. All right. So I'm, I'm at minus one. So I'm actually only at three. Then he's at five, seven. So man, he just completely demolished me. So I take one point of damage on Grumple. And Grumple has four hit points. And now he's gonna do that same attack again, but I don't have any defense. And so I'm automatically gonna take a point of damage. Man, this guy is brutal. Poor Grumple's getting his her butt kicked <laughs> on this first turn. Okay, so we're gonna put him over there. So now we're back to the hunters. And the gecko hunters have a two, so they're gonna do this precise shot. Um, a defense action card must be used to initiate a defense skill against... Oh, that's right, you can use any card to initiate a defense. I forgot. So let's... Um, hmm, let's see here. Maybe we should back up and um, and use this green three. Well, you know what, I think it's too late. We're gonna keep playing. I made a mistake, a tactical error, uh, because I forgot that you can use, uh, let's see, you can use any, where is the, uh... yes, yeah, so the enemy now attacks the targeted character. The character may then defend by resolving an opposed skill test of any attribute. I completely forgot about that. I was thinking that you had to use a defense card, but you don't. That was a tactical error that could cost us this mission, uh, but that's okay. We're gonna keep going. So in order to defend against these guys though, these hunters, you have to use uh, the blue defense. But I'm not gonna be able to do that. Um, and so he has a range of three. I could target Grumple or I could target Messiah. Um, let's see here, and a five, I have no way of dodging it or of, um, with Messiah, so I think I am going to go ahead and target Messiah, because the range is three of one, two, and so Messiah is going to take one damage as well. This is not a very good start, <laughs> start to this adventure, but okay, so that is the enemy's turn. So now we are on to Messiah's turn. Oh boy, all right, so Messiah has one card. I need to draw. Oh, and then we clear out the threat from the threat track and those get discarded. So we should be relatively safe for at least a little while. So one, two, three, four. Oh my gosh, <laughs> absolutely terrible. Okay, we, man, this could be the fastest game of Aftermath of all time. Okay, so the first thing we do is we drew this Calamity card. So this comes into play. And what we do is we read the Calamity effect on the, uh, sorry for the glare there. Let's see there. So we're going to read the Calamity effect. Um, the Calamity effect, if, if triggered, a dark shadow glides over you, as does a tiny pinpoint of red. Dust Feather's laser eye searches for a victim. So if the Calamity happens, then um, this Dust Feather character comes onto the board hunting us. So we need to roll a three plus. We're gonna add our time. Our time is one, and then we roll this, and we have plus one, so that means it's two, so the Calamity does not trigger. Thankfully, okay. However, these now get placed into the threat track, which means the enemies are going to take another turn. Oh, we have to do these randomly. Uh, the enemies are gonna take another turn. A three, okay, and a one. That was very, very unfortunate. And Messiah is not left with a lot of cards to do much of anything. Holy crap, this is terrible. Well, I think Messiah is just gonna have to stand back because he can't move past this green line. He doesn't have enough points of movement. He has, he could spend all of these to have three points of movement to get across that green line. But once he did, there would be nothing to, nothing uh, to do there. 
and oh man yeah this turned really bad uh the first time i played this scenario it was this bad the second time i played i got through very easily and now we're back to bad <laughs> so okay so what are we going to do here well i can't really take any actions now we're going to check threat and yes we indeed have some threat so the gecko leader is going to use his boomerang he's going to target a character up to two away for an attack of four um, a character wounded by this attack becomes badly hurt so that's a status and I'm gonna go ahead and have Messiah take it because I can well no nope, we're gonna have um, Grumple take it it's an attack of four I'm gonna spend that to um, block it for three adding Grumple's ability of one which is four so um, right now it looks like we are even on attack so it's just gonna be the dice plus one plus one okay so we tie it we beat we match the um, threat so we don't have to take any damage so grumble successfully blocks the gecko leaders boomerang thank god and then next up we have the gecko hunter and it is going to do a precise shot so it needs um, again it needs the um, the blue icon to to uh, protect so we're gonna have the gecko hunter um, target Messiah. Messiah is going to spend those to have three because um, it matches. So we're going to initiate it with that and then that matches the color or the number. So we're at three and the attack is at five. Oh man. I'm pretty sure Messiah is going to take an attack here unless the black is really good and the white is or the black is really bad and the white is really good. Um, no. <laughs> not, not even close. So Messiah takes a, another point of damage. Move this back to the threat track. Move this back to the discard. Add another point of damage to Messiah. Man, both of my heroes right now are at two. They only have two hit points left. This is only our second turn. Uh, yes, things are not going good for my little critters. And I think we're gonna have to pause it there and come back to for the next chapter to see if I can even survive this first mission. Uh, we, this may be an uphill battle. In this game, you don't fail. You, it's a fail forward design philosophy. So um, there is a way to, even if you lose, to continue playing and experiencing the campaign. But all right, so I hope you enjoyed this first turn and we will talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.